Hello once again and welcome to Lockdown Church here at Wisher UF. We're going to begin with our reading, continuing with our reading in Galatians chapter 5 and reading verses 19 through to the end of the chapter. This is God's word to us. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. And may God bless this portion of his word to each one of us. Now, I can't emphasize enough how vital and powerful the fruits of the Spirit are. When you look at the world as it comes to us via the television, you see so much of the acts of the sinful nature that are described by Paul in that passage. And whether it's in the news, in soap uh, programs or movies, these acts prevalent in Paul's time are very much the evidence of life in every age of the, this fallen world. In other words, despite the best of attentions by myriads of the best of reforming groups and charities, the root cause, the sinful nature, can only be truly reformed by a radical change of heart. And it is only God who can do that. So when these fruit are displayed by Christian believers, they stand in total contrast to how the world often behaves. And if these fruit are genuinely displayed, they will point people to God. Remember Jesus indicated in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 16. Well, we come to faithfulness. It's often remarked that a dog is a man's best friend. Even if you've never owned a dog as a pet, you will know that if they're brought up and trained properly, they will show lifelong loyalty. I'm sure you're aware of Greyfriars Bobby, the Sky Terrier who became famous in the 19th century in Edinburgh for spending 14 years protecting the grave of his owner. And he did so until he died himself, the dog. Such loyalty and faithfulness is not as readily shown by many human beings. And so Paul rightly stresses this fruit of faithfulness. Now the meaning of faithfulness, it refers to loyalty to God, faithfulness to God, to his will, plus of course loyalty and faithfulness to people. And certainly this is one of God's many attributes. Let me give you a few examples from the Bible. Psalm 33 verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right and true, he is faithful in all he does. Psalm 145 verse 13, the Lord is faithful to all his promises. Psalm 146 verse 6, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. And Psalm 37 verse 28, for the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. And these are a, a few examples, and they actually demand much contemplation. Just summarising, faithfulness embodies everything 
that God does. And not only is his word right and true, he is 100% faithful in keeping all the promises that he has made in Scripture. And his faithfulness never ends. And he shows that faithfulness to those who are faithful to him. So not only is God the supreme um, and perfect example of faithfulness, he expects faithfulness from us. Indeed, we will only know and experience his faithfulness by our continuing faithfulness and loyalty to him. Now, this is a tall order when we are so familiar with unfaithfulness and broken promises, not just amongst unbelievers, but with ourselves. All the more reason, as with all these fruit, to make every effort in the power of the Holy Spirit to a consistency of faithfulness to God and to others. To put it in a simple phrase, say what you mean and mean what you say. Or don't just say you're a Christian, be a Christian. Next up is gentleness. Right away in our arrogant, self-righteous and survival of the fittest world, this would seem to make Christians more like wimps, gentleness. But let's remember, the teaching of Jesus turned the world's principles on their head. Just read the Sermon on the Mount. Furthermore, it was because the disciples of Jesus applied his teaching that they turned the world upside down. And we are here to testify to that today. The word means meekness and is the very opposite of violence and anger outbursts such as described uh, in the passage we looked at, the acts of the sinful nature. And we only need to look not only to the teaching of Jesus but to the character of his lived out life. Now whilst there were times Jesus had to say some very strong things to those who should have known better, the, relig the religious le leaders, in his treatment of children, women, the poor, the hungry, the sick, anyone who was ignored by society, we see in Jesus' conduct and actions the epitome of gentleness, meekness, and compassion. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In other words, what we see in him and his teaching, we can apply with the assurance of his help every step of the way as illustrated by the yoke. Not the yoke we Johnny thought came from the eggs of Jesus' chickens, but the beam that shouldered two oxen so they could bear the load together. The Apostle Paul contrasts the way of the world with the, Christ, with the Christian spirit in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 21, a church that had many unchristian issues. And he said this, what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? 1 Corinthians 4 21. And in a letter, uh, a later letter, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and following. Now, you don't need me to, to prove to you that a gentle response or reaction is far more welcoming and calming than an aggressive one. And as I reminded you last week from the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Golden Rule, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And the final fruit here in Galatians 5, that of self-control. Now the previous eight fruit generally have to do with our conduct and behaviour towards other people. But self-control is primarily to do with restraining our passions, our appetites. The Greek meaning is that, is that power to keep yourself in check. Now, understanding this is, is no problem for us. 
When you see an injustice, and you want justice because you've seen that, and it often never seems to come, and so you can easily burn within, and in some cases you may take things into your own hands if that was possible, or at least you fantasise about it. How often, for example, in lockdown, have you got frustrated or angry because of the constraints and you've ended up breaking the rules or, or bending the rules? When you look again at the acts of the sinful nature, many of them are committed through selfishness instead of self-control. And sad to say, many a Christian church or denomination in history has refrained at times from self-control and as a result created division, hurt and often permanent damage. The fact is that as Christians we know what to do and how to live and certainly so with regard to these fruit of the Spirit. So how can we ensure that we cultivate them? Well this is where self-control comes in. In the first place, we obviously have to be Christian so that we can call on the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's then a case of learning to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to allow him to control. In other words, it's to discipline ourselves to obedience. And this is where the vital work on our part comes into play. And it's all to do with the mind, as the Apostle Paul puts it. This is Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Simply put, we have to unlearn worldly habits and focus our minds on godly habits. The fruit, for example and learning them. And it's learning and adopting God's pattern of living according to his ways. Now this is not something that automatically happens, but it has to be worked at every day. Paul again says practically, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. Other helpful and practical advice was penned by Job in the Old Testament, especially in the light of sexual immorality, something that's highlighted in the acts of the sinful nature in Galatians 5. Job says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And he, of course, is highlighting the temptation of lust, which essentially means desiring anything that is not permitted for us. For some, it might be the lust for chocolate or coveting what someone else has just to be like them or to think you could be better than them. Maybe as I'm saying this, you can think of other examples. No one was more self-controlled than Jesus as he willingly surrendered himself to the Father's will to go to the cross for us. And may that fact spur us all on with regard to our self-control. Now, God willing, we will look further at this passage uh, next week. But in the meantime, God be with you in your understanding and in your application of these powerful fruit for the glory of God. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, thank you that in the midst of these unprecedented days, with all its changes and uncertainties, you are the constant God. We praise you for all that you are, and as we have been thinking, all your wondrous and dependable attributes. We thank you that the infection rates and deaths from the coronavirus are diminishing, but recognise the effects upon related families and loved ones is much harder because of isolation. Be gracious and merciful to all, providing comfort and meeting every need. 
Whilst the clapping for the NHS has stopped, we nevertheless continue to appreciate the dedication and sacrifice all make in fighting this deadly infection. Give strength, energy and rest to all dealing with the patients. We remember also those with other serious health issues. May they not be neglected, but receive whatever treatment required in good time. We pray also that as lockdown measures ease throughout the UK, there will not be a second spike of the infection. Grant speed and efficiency in the research, development and production of a vaccine, recognising we will not be safe till there is one. In the meantime, the world lives on amidst all manner of issues. Recent weeks have seen much in the way of protests, demonstrations and violence. We recognise the deep-seated problems behind these circumstances and that they are passionately held on all sides. We pray for peace and self-controlled times to discuss through all the issues to satisfactory conclusions. Grant blessing and good health to our families, friends and church family. May your fruit displayed in us draw others to yourself. We pray for the day when some sense of normality will return, that we may then live more carefully and responsibly from the lessons learned through these different days. In Jesus' name we pray.